Hi, this is Nalanjana and I welcome you all to another great session of Srijan Wednesday webinars. For those who are joining us for the first time, this is a community initiative by Srijan Technologies. As a part of this initiative, we host webinars every alternate Wednesday. We invite experts from different domains who talk on subjects like front-end technologies, UI UX, mobile apps, media, entrepreneurship, community building, digital marketing and many more. In today's webinar, we will explore the relationship between UI and UX. Our speaker will take us through a four-step process of building a UX that makes the customers happy and is able to timely measure customer feedback. We will look at real-world apps, their evolving UI, and find out whether it impacted their user experience for better or for worse. I would request all participants to please type in their questions that you have during the presentation and we'll take them up in the last 15 minutes of this session. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. We have with us Smita Mishra. Smita is the founder of Pool Wallet, an online expense sharing app and is the CEO and chief test consultant at QA Zone Infosystems, which is a software testing organization. She enjoys problem solving. She supports her customers in identifying the risks their applications are carrying and or passing on further to their end users through carefully crafted skills of product development and software testing. Smita also engages with different forums to assess the growth of women in the field of technology and otherwise. Thank you, Smita, for joining us today. While you get hooked on to Smita's presentation, Please don't forget to take this conversation live on Twitter using our hashtag SrijanWW. You can share your thoughts by tagging us and Smita in your tweets using our handles at the rate Srijan and at the rate Smita underscore QA zone. So without taking up any more of your time, let's get started. Smita, over to you. All right, guys. So... This is Smita, I'm your speaker for your webinar on navigating the UX jungle, so we succeed. Um, let, me, let me just quickly, and because my introduction has already been done, and thanks Nilanjana for giving the wonderful introduction. I would quickly start uh, with the presentation. So why are we here? And, oh, okay. So just to understand, uh, maybe to be a Tarzan, because we're talking about navigating the jungle. So if, if you can remember any of your shows that you might have seen of the Tarzan, you would be able to at least uh, compare how Tarzan looks at jungle and how somebody, an outsider or a tourist person or a hunter would look at a jungle. And the idea is to be the Tarzan of the jungle and be able to optimize and maximize the use of resources that you have and at the same time make the best, of, best out of it and be uh, a successful navigator of your jungle. So let's, let's understand what we're talking about. What is UI? User interface. Yes, we all understand the English of it. And what is UX? User experience. Fair. Are they same? A lot of people use them very interchangeably. UI, UX. I would like to disagree there, like whether UI or UX can be interchangeably used, because um, the way we look at it is user interface is actually a subset of user experience. User interface is more about how it, uh, how your interface actually looks. What is the interface design? How does it visually appeal to the user? However, user experience is more about how does a user actually go from point A to point B? And what is his experience while doing that? And if you can look at the screen, there are tons of, uh, tons of points there that User experience is about field research, is about a product design, is about creating personas, prototyping, usability, all of it. And whereas user interface is indeed limited to interface design and visual design. What we are going to talk today about is more about the user experience. I do not, I cannot currently see your backgrounds. Where are all our 
uh, listeners from. But I do assume that since you are here to listen to this particular presentation, you are probably involved in developing a product and are concerned about your user experience or in a, in a positive way and you want to make sure that your user is happy and you are, th therefore you are looking at various options. However, when you actually start thinking about user experience, quite a lot of people actually start talking about things like it should, uh, I mean they start about uh, talking about the traditional stuff and uh, some guidelines and mention that uh, uh, maybe these sidebars, maybe that color schemes, and, and they try to limit it to those options. Whereas, and, uh, and users and companies are actually spending a lot of time in deciding the colors, bars on the screen, but frankly, is it really that important? Are we overthinking? Are we trying to put a lot of stress on the UI just to make sure that UX is good, the user experience is good, whereas it may not be necessary? And to be honest, when we are reading through so many books and trying so many tricks with the popular uh, uh, websites and apps, frankly, one of the thoughts that we came across, one of the observations that we came across is there are very, very, very few known techniques that can accurately and consistently shape a good UI UX. You cannot just write it down that do these 10 particular op, uh, activities and you are going to just be, th that option rate of user is going to be really high and you're going to be the best. Because it doesn't work like this. You never, there are, there are certain activities that you can perform to design your user experience, but you cannot really, uh, to design for user experience, but you cannot really guarantee that this is exactly how your experience will be. So you can't design the user experience, but you sure can design for it. So you, you, there is a way to have a good and a consistent, maybe a better user experience for your user of the app, but that's, that's not something that you can guarantee. So I would say but, but still, it's, it's important. It's, it's important to the success of your app that your user is happy. It, it, it fulfills the need. So what do you do? Well, looking at some of the popular trends, we came up with some uh, observations. So one of them was beauty beyond looks. That means probably we are overthinking on the looks, looks part, and we should pro look more towards uh, maybe the content, maybe the exact uh, layering of data. So we'll come down to that, what, what are the different things that you could look at. But let's first look at a few popular websites and applications which are not so beautiful by the conventional definition of beauty. That was Reddit, this is Amazon, and here is Craigslist. And Craigslist is notoriously, I wouldn't say ugly, but yeah, they, they just stayed the way they are. And only off late they have changed some bit in their maps. Amazon is as simple as it could be forever. And very recently when they have changed some bit in their UI. However, Reddit has forever been this way. They have never changed anything. And none of them look a very attractive uh, color scheme or attractive site. But they are all very, very, very popular and hugely successful sites. Under, um, so let me just mention this at this point, that if, if you look at these sites and you think that maybe we should now change our websites or our apps, or if you look at any other popular sites and you think that your app should be like that and you should maybe make some changes, I'll be honest that users do not welcome change easy. So when you are making that step towards uh, improving your user experience and making these changes on your uh, whether it is the look, whether it is the flow of uh, activities, be very careful because um, let's let's go by uh, our historical data. Uh, let's let's see Facebook. A lot of times, uh, Facebook does make changes, and we look at it. And for a lot of times, don't you hear your friends saying, "I don't know why Facebook is doing this. I don't know why Facebook has done this." They don't like this. They don't seem to have good enough designers. They don't seem to have good enough content people. 
but then eventually people get used to it and slowly use it because it's a feature by feature change and, and it, it's like you, you're so hooked on to the app that you don't want to really leave. Um, I don't know if many of us here know about Dig, but it was a very popular, very, very popular uh, news site like Reddit, actually multiple more times more popular than um, Re Reddit itself that it is today. Dig was that popular and they came up with this um, Dig version 3.0. It was a newer version of the uh, UI and UX, so they said that we've changed the entire user experience. The customer experience is going to be hugely better and really different. And they came up with Dig 3.0 and it only took the users one week to actually I mean, move from Dig to Reddit. Frankly, Reddit was coexisting with Dig, but there was never, uh, uh, it, it was not really comparable at that stage. But that one week of Dig 3.0 being in market made Reddit what it is today. And Reddit has never changed their user experience or UI since then. And that, that kind of is, is it is a really surprising thing because it was like a massive exodus from the, of the users from Dig to Reddit. And let, let me give you another example of eBay. I don't know how many of you started to use eBay when it used to look like this. It uh, does show some elements of ugly gradient still on, on this one. This is the older one, very, very original. Um, they had this yellow screen on them and Google came up with uh, this uh, white space uh, application. So in response to the good feedback that Google was getting, eBay decided to actually move on to the white screen. And they designed a completely new look for eBay, which is very similar to what you see today. It was like all white space, and, and they rolled out th that, that version. And the users got so offended that even back, I mean, in, back in those days, people used to write hate mails manually. So they, the users actually came back and started to say, why did you take away the yellow? It looked so good on eBay. And though it, the world was moving towards uh, white space, but the users, eBay users, were so hung up on the particular color that it, 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 was like a, it wasn't like a small feedback they were getting. A lot of them started to complain that we do not like this look to the point where the management took a decision, let's not change it. Let's go back to yellow, write an algorithm that changes the color, one, light, one shade light each day, and finally, after a year's time, they were all white. So it's like not fooling the user in one shot, but fooling them stepwise. That's because the users resisted that change, and industry was moving towards white space, and the CTO had to do it. So imagine if that that becomes your nightmare someday. All right, another observation that we had uh, based on the popular sites was, the users should feel smart while using your app. When they look at the application, they shouldn't feel, um, they shouldn't feel like they're not able to understand how to go around it. It should be fairly simple and upfront, what you call as uh, intuitive. Let's quickly look at this image. I cannot see the, okay, let me see the chat one. Okay. So, can anyone guess here how many, which, which particular salt, which one is the salt shaker? The one with uh, two holes or the one with three holes? Uh, when we did this exercise in the classroom, they were like half of them saying two holes, half of them saying three holes, and frankly, I do not know which one it is. But I do know that this, just by looking at it, maybe it's a cool design, but it's not telling me which one is salt. What if I just, what if I just kept my salt shaker like this? What's the harm in it? Just, just if if we could just uh, make the users understand the choices they make instead of. Uh, making the user feel a little stupid uh, for sprinkling salt where he needed to sprinkle pepper. So why, why, why couldn't we actually make the users do it? So make, make the features and your application design so simple that the users actually feel smart. And the way to do it is be intuitive. 
use stuff that is more familiar. Yeah, let me, uh, okay, let me quickly come to this particular example. When you enter a dark room, imagine that you just cannot see anything in that dark room. The first thing you want to look at is the switchboard to switch on the light so you're able to see what's there in that room. Where do you want to, I mean, where do you start looking for it? You don't really go around the room and start looking for it. You, you, you are at the door and you start looking at the walls near to the door and check it to your left and maybe to your right and, and just want the switchboard right there near next to the door. What if it was all the way across on the wall opposite? That's a problem because the user is not expecting that. So similarly, when you're developing your apps, uh, maybe one of the good things is to use familiar options. For example, uh, let's talk about the hamburger menu. I do not agree that it's the most prettiest one. No, it's not. But it's certainly very, very, very familiar one. So when you add, when, when, a, when a designer is using a hamburger menu, which you can see on your Facebook, which you can see on your LinkedIn, you immediately, the user immediately knows that that's going to activate my sidebar. So he feels good about being able to use and explore that app. Is it the most beautiful way of uh, displaying or designing? Maybe not. But it certainly works where you have to have a familiarity and you have to let the user explore the app. So before we go further on um, these steps um, on how to build the UX, let me, let me be honest that though the test and collect is mentioned at the end, when we reach there, uh, you'll realize that you have to do this activity constantly from the start. So let's, let's uh, to be able to design a good user experience and a UI included in it, we came up with this four-step uh, process where you should narrow, build, test, and collect analytics, and then finally simplify. Okay. What do we mean by narrowing? Narrow is narrow the target users. So you need to identify a narrow band of target users for your initial traction and early adopters. I cannot tell you how many times people just say, um, young kids, young kids are my target users. Now young kids are frankly a how young or young women are my target audience. Frankly, that's not, that's not how you define your target users. Your target users have to be so specific that you should be able to actually go and pick them. You should be able to identify with those names that you are targeting. So it has to be really narrowed down. What it does is it actually speeds up your development time because now you do not have a whole bunch of, um, whole bunch of users. You know very specifically which user are you targeting so, and what are the key features that that particular user would be using? So you can actually develop your minimum viable product really quick. Guides testing, yes, we will look at it later in this stage, but yes, definitely knowing your users, you, you, it helps you narrow down your strategy for testing. Gives marketing individuals early insight into user acquisition strategies. As much as a person likes to be a, a, a company or a product would like to be unique, Frankly, there is always some tangential similarity between two products. So when your marketing people are talking about uh, a particular, uh, about marketing your product, it gets very easier for the marketing folks to understand how to go about the uh, user acquisition because they know what kind of users you are targeting and what kind of uh, products do we have which are similar to, your pro to this particular product which helps these marketing people to narrow down their marketing strategies to be able to acquire more users and what kind of users they should acquire. Narrows down the number of variables in testing, surely, and definitely saves money when you're able to actually uh, save on development time, testing time, in marketing strategies, you surely save money. 
let me, uh, at this point, let me just quickly talk to you about Google. Today, you, none of us can actually think about Google without uh, thinking about uh, Android, without thinking about the Google Play Store. However, we all know that that's not where they started. They started as a search engine, and that too they started on number 12. They were not the leading uh, search engine when they started. So they, it, it was it was really not the, um, I mean, today they have actually grown up. Google has grown up. But when they started, they picked up one thing, becoming a search engine. Then they said, OK, we, bec we become the best search engine. And they did. And then they brought out all kinds of business apps and Play Stores and Android platform. And they did all kind of thing. Now they are getting into drones and whatever they are doing. But they started small. And they made sure they become a niche wherever they were. So similarly, let's, let's look at uh, Amazon. If any one of us remembers, what, what did Amazon start as? It started as a uh, book selling platform, all new books, never an old book. But it started as a book selling platform where people could just come and sell their books and buy books. And today, Amazon is like, it's selling a whole range of stuff. It's, it's the leading e-commerce player across the globe. And, and they've, they've done it well, but they also started small. So the idea of having nar being narrow is start small. Pick one particular activity, do it well, and then build it, just like uh, Twitter. We all know where the 140 characters of Twitter comes from. It was an SMS chat-based application, and uh, SMS application, sorry. And that 140 characters is limitation comes from there. And look at Twitter today. It's a whole different application. But whatever, wherever they started, they were they actually won that battle one by one, and they became big. So thinking about all the big popular applications, uh, the point here is first pick up your most important uh, target uh, users and features, and then really excel in it and then grow bigger. OK. Let's, let's come to define the product. Once, once you have narrowed down your users, you need to really, I mean, uh, not narrow down users, but to, to be able to narrow your users and product and how your product is going to be used, you need to actually be able to define them. So let's first go on defining product. Now, this is an overhead projector. And this is the format that we could actually fill it up with. Blank is a blank that allows blank to blank. Let me, let me fill it up for you. A product is a general relatable tool that allows, there are two adjectives that I've added to target users to use case. What this means is, as a, as a product designer, if as a startup uh, founder, as a product owner, if you have to define your product, what does your product do? This is how you would define it. For example, if it's a, uh, when we say gen a product is, let's say, overhead projector here, generally relatable tool. Relatable in the sense we spoke about None of the products are, I mean, unless it's really, really unique spacecraft kind of thing, which, which nobody else had ever made, which lands somewhere on some other planet, then most of the products are in some way relatable tangentially to some other product. A lot of people actually use it as a phrase, Uber for this, Uber for f uh, food industry, Uber for uh, tech industry, Uber for education industry, some, something like that. So you can relate to Uber. Similarly, you could you could put a particular relatable tools name there or a particular, uh, uh, let's say, if it is overhead projector, it's a, it's a lens, it's a projecting beam. It's a, uh, it, it projects the uh, content of your laptop. So you can, you can say something like maybe a lens, which allows you to see uh, it in an enlarged form on the wall. So when, when you come back to, I mean, that's, that's a general relatable tool that I'm mentioning, the lens. When you come to the users, 
as we mentioned earlier, the target users have to be so specific it, that you can actually pick them. So you have to add uh, two adjectives, say an age range, their gender, their nationality, their uh, behavior, their, some specifics, and then um, take that to become, to use case. So use case as in for OHP, it will be to project your presentations in a group of team to be able to see what one person has on his laptop as a group on a wall. So what exactly, what is your most important stuff? What is your most important activity that your product is doing? You need to mention that use case here. And at this point, maybe we'll just take a quick, we'll do a quick activity. All the attendees, if you could quickly think of the product you are building and type into your chat window or question window here and if you could write down your product in this format for me to read out. I give you, I give you a minute to do that. Please think about the product you are working on, whether you're testing, whether you're developing, designing. Think about your product and actually uh, fill into this blank is a blank that allows blank to blank. Think about the relatable tool, think about the users that you have and put it here and to the, and which is your best fit use case. I'll give you a minute. All right, come on, send it in. We're waiting on you to type down your sentence. This could be very simple, that that's fine. We'll, we'll learn together. Um, Nilanjana, I'm unable to see any of them coming up. Do you see any? Um, no, uh, uh, we could see three of those. Can you see them? No, actually. I'm so sorry. I cannot. Okay. Can you just read it out to me? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, our first answer is by Steve Beatty. Uh, she says, uh, he says, OnTrack is a web application that allows teachers to help their students achieve academic success. Our, uh, another one is by Ankur N. Online survey mm -hmm. platform, Feeds mm -hmm. Insight Survey is an online survey platform that allows companies e-commerce to engage its customer and gather employee feedbacks. Uh, another mm -hmm. product is Windchill, a tool that allows users to manage their data. Mm -hmm. All right, so could you take up any of uh, these? Yeah, uh, I would actually like to go with uh, Steve's, if you could repeat it for me. Okay. OnTrack is a? So OnTrack is a web application that allows teachers to help their students achieve academic success. Application that allows teachers help their students achieve academic success. All right. OK. So hey, thank you, guys, all three of you. Thank you for actually writing out um, your thoughts. And thank you, Steve. I'm just picking up your sentence. And um, good job, all three of you, actually. You did well, uh, much better than what I had uh, expected a newcomer to do. 
So I'm sure you are all seasoned professionals. However, I will mention that when we are speaking about web application, on track is a web application. Uh, frankly, is it a is it a testing web application? Is it a teaching application? Is it an online video? Is it a classroom training uh, where we run this application? Exactly uh, what kind of web application or where I could use it is not clear. When we say that allows teachers to help their students achieve academic success, I don't know if these teachers and students are from the kindergarten side or are they from the school side or are they from the college side or are they business executives taking long I mean, uh, taking executive classes which are not really full time but uh, evening classes or online classes for specific subjects. So I don't know if I am the marketing person or if I am a designer who has to design the app then I would have a little difficulty in trying to identify the users or design it. What we could actually do is, when we are, and, and I'm not saying this is completely wrong, I'm just saying that we could actually add a little more specific aspect to this description. For example, um, but, but it was a good attempt though, but for example, let's, let's go for the users. We are saying this particular app on track, which is a web application, to be used by teachers and students, we need to think about who are those users. And which brings me to the point, to our next point, which is define personas. So when you are actually talking about your application, it could be, uh, you, you need to, when you're saying it's a web application, you could actually add a little more detail to it, that web application as in training, as in testing, as in self-learn app, whatever it is, a little more details to that. And then that allows users to help, uh, teachers to help their students. So let's think about those teachers, those personas. Let's think about those students and actually come up with thoughts as to who those teachers and students would be. Are these very specific to a particular subject, particular class, particular region, nation, where, who is learning and who is teaching? So when we think about that, that would actually help us define our persona exactly. And then I, sh because the moment I say teacher, there are like hundreds of teachers in our mind. But when I'm able to define that persona, I should be able to say that specific teacher is the one I'm targeting. Those two are the kinds that I'm targeting. So let's, let's do another quick round where define your persona. Who, who do you think is your user? with a little more detail, as, as much detail you could. And you don't have to, it doesn't have to be like a whole lot of details, but as much as you can quickly write in a line or two. And if you could just type it out. I'll give you another one minute to all the users to type out the think Even if you're not related to this particular example or this particular product that we're talking, think about your target users. Think about who is that end user who's going to use your product and write it down into the, into the chat window that this is my user, very specific. All right, come on, be quick and type in whatever you think. It could be one word, one sentence, anything is really fine. And we'll, we'll actually, after just or after this sentence is okay. part, um, after this. Hi, Smita. Yeah, we started uh, so, to get to. Uh, I yeah. would just quickly give you the organizer control so that way you will be able to see uh, whatever is being typed in. Is that OK? All right. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so are you able to see?
see now? Okay, so we see that in the question block, yes, right? Yes, it's in the questions pane. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so so far this is what we have received. Okay, so we haven't received anything in answer to your second question. So if you want, guys, and I, yeah, I think we we did receive uh, Steve's second version of it. Yes, he sent a more specific one. Guys, other than Steve too, any any particular application that you are using? I see a lot of them here who have mentioned different. Uh, yeah, I see Sandeep Kirk here. Come on, guys, start putting in your details. Any kind of uh, any kind of user that you can think of that your product or if you're planning to start up what kind of product you would develop or what which kind of user you could just type it in here <coughs> excuse me all right uh, what we can do is you can just go ahead with the second draft that Steve has put in here which says on track is a suite of web app web based applications that allows K-12 teachers to assess their students and track their students' academic progress in a variety of subjects. Definitely a much better attempt, definitely more specific and does help us in getting in there and to be able to understand more as to whoever persona is, whoever user is. But let's define the persona of that user a little bit more. For example, Let's look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. If we were actually looking at a particular app that a woman should use, let's say in Brazil, you know, let's say it's a it's a women security app. What if we just said uh, it has to be used by uh, women in Brazil? That's all. That's not going to work. It's not uh, because because there are all ages of women. There are some who are, can operate technology. There are some who cannot operate technology. You have to be specific as to what kind of women are we talking? What's the age range? What do they do? Are they really tech savvy? Can they actually understand this product? Can they use it? And similarly, here uh, maybe this this particular uh, persona is being developed for. Uh, some from, for some food uh, industry app because we are tracking her behavior of how often is she uh, probably taking away food, how often is she cooking. What, whatever could be our objective, we need to track some small uh, points about that user like her demographics, like where she lives, what's her family, what kind of, what's her age, what kind of earn, monthly earnings she has. But these, these are are details that may or may not be 100% true for all to be captured for all the users. You may not be able to get these kind of details for all, and this is like this is like all of it. But you don't really have to put so much of detail, but you surely have to come up with Mary. It's a 34-year-old. It's a working mom, and she doesn't clean her place. She has a house cleaner, so which tells us that she has more time to do something else and she lives in London and she has two kids so she she needs more time for her friends and she needs to be she needs help in um, managing her kids and keep things running so we, we could kind of understand who we are talking about and uh, since she's a working woman and she's needing some time so maybe when a marketer is trying to push and add or push your product to, uh, let's say it's about a time management product or it's a, a health health fitness uh, specific product, maybe she is somebody who could use it. She is a working person. Maybe if, if we could add a little more detail here, whether she's tech savvy or not, that would help more. So, okay. Moving forward, once you've defined your personas, once you've identified their behaviors, their demographics, and what are they looking for, and you have a quite a quite a good idea of who could be your user uh, user, and we have already defined the product in a more relatable way, we could move on to storyboards. 
what is a storyboard? A storyboard is where you actually put in what your persona is going to do with your product. So you start with your first screen and you kind of develop how is your user going to use your product from screen one to the end. So you keep on building the screens and this is a screenshot from the iOS one and most of them have this. You have other tools to do it. But the idea is to identify and cut long trees and branches. What that means is one of the leading uh, pro uh, product managers of a leading uh, pro startup here in India, they are into e-commerce for uh, uh, household items and they were uh, and furnishing items. And they said to me, Smitha, we have like a 15 to 16 percent user drop on every new click. So I, if I add one more click to my uh, purchase system, I have a user drop of 15 to 16 percent, which is a huge drop. And imagine if we if we did not optimize our our process and the storyboard doesn't go smooth into uh, most optimized clicks, then you are losing 15% users on each new click and it keeps on dropping. So your chances of success are dropping with the same, with, with the same num uh, acceleration. Okay, Identify dead ends, places where the user gets stuck, you need to identify them. All right, so this is all part of narrowing. We identified our product, we identified our um, kind of our personas, we did our storyboards, how are we going to do it, and then we come down to actually building the product. When, when you're building this particular your app, it's very likely that you're not going to build a perfect product on the first go, and which is very acceptable, but speed is king. A lot of your initial users are going to be good enough to give you feedback. They're going to either, I mean, and, and the feedback could be, could be very, very um, explicit or could be implicit. If they stop using your app, it's an implicit feedback. They're not interested. If, if you keep uh, a feedback section and they're good enough to you, they would actually tell you what's not working. In either case, when you're developing, when you're building your product, it will be very, um, and there are other ways to gather feedback, which we'll discuss in your test and collect analytics. But while you're developing your product, while you're building it, you will see all the signs of what change should be. And there would be other products coming up in the market which would have the same features and same ability, almost comparable abilities. So speed is king. Keep iterating, keep building it, and keep rebuilding it, keep breaking the features and rebuilding it. So you have tons of tools here that I have mentioned that you can see. These, these tools, use these tools to actually build, distribute. So, for example, HTML5, it's, it's a good platform to build your apps, and most of us know it, Kinotopia, 99designs, go on any of the platforms, build it. Uh, you could use uh, HubSpot or MailChimp to actually distribute and or send across your marketing stuff and distribute your app for uh, people to use it or to test it. Then you could use uh, Collect. Uh, you could collect uh, analytics. You could use Heap for uh, collecting such uh, analytics. A lot of people do use uh, Google Analytics. However, what happens is Google Analytics uh, only specifically captures uh, the screens where you have mentioned or specific activities. What if you go back and you start to analyze uh, your product as to what happened after this, what happened, what this this particular user did after he she went on this page, you may not be able to generate that kind of data at, uh, at that moment because and Google Analytics probably did not capture it. What he does is it captures everything, so you don't have to go back and think, oh, well, I should have actually applied analytics to that page too. You can just collect all the data there. And you could actually use heap for that, but the idea is that collecting uh, user, collecting the user analytics and what the users are doing on your app is very very important. It tells you the user behavior and their expectations and where you are losing your uh, customers the most. That's that's something that would help you. 
Okay, simplify. Why we did not mention simplify at this stage of narrowing or building is that you do not want to overly simplify your product in your mind before starting it. Though you don't have to overly complicate it, but it will really help if you have at least uh, part of your product developed and then start to simplify because then it, you would have the key features in. You, you narrowed down your users, you built your product. Now you understand what is your user using that product for? What is your user actually, how is the user using it? Where are they dropping off? Which is the particular feature used most? And then you will understand that how we could optimize it. Very recently, we also developed a project, a product, and I'll, I'll share the example. We, we, we thought that the hamburger menu is so, uh, family is, is so popular, everybody is using it. Let's let's put the hamburger menu. It was a fintech product, and what we realize is that the hamburger menu actually creates a lot of clicks. You have to click through a lot of stuff to reach where you want to. So we had to, even if it was a very popular way, we had to now redesign our UI to simplify our product so that the number of clicks are optimized so that the number of screens that is between the user's um, the login and to his purchase or the activity that we wanted them to do is done without the user losing interest in it. So, uh, simplify your product, make sure your user is able to do the same activities with ease, with more ease. Test. So what we mean by testing here is we need to develop the product with, as the minimum viable product. So we already understood what are our users, we built the product, now we have to simplify it and we have captured all the key features that we wanted to build for our product, for our users and that, that particular set of features that our product has put together is called the minimum viable product which can which you can roll out into the market for beta testing or for your users to do some initial uh, use and give you feedback and that once you've developed that product, then you need to actually, again, test for analytics. However, uh, since we are now getting into test, let me be honest, this testing is, is not like uh, your SDLC testing, that once you have developed your entire product and then you're coming to test. Your testing strategy for your user experience has to be a little different than how you have tested for other, other aspects of, uh, for example, uh, function, functional testing or performance or security or any other aspect that you're testing, your user experience um, testing is going to be a little different. It's going to be done from the start, which is quite, uh, nowadays everybody is doing that for functional testing too, but you need to, uh, you need to actually map your user experience to certain different uh, thoughts. For example, business goals. Now you need to understand that what is the idea behind developing the product. What is that important problem that this particular app is solving? It's, it's uh, idea is good, but yeah, I, I would go back on idea and say the problem. Most problem, uh, the problem that the app is solving is more important than the idea. So there could be a very beautiful idea, but if it is not solving a uh, a new problem, or if it is not solving an existing problem more effectively then you have a wrong business goal. That means your app is anyways not heading towards success because um, it's, it's doing something which probably somebody else is doing. So you need to first understand what is your business goal and then come to the user ex experience strategy that how are you thinking that your user is going to go from point A to point B? How are your designers designing this particular aspect and with your architects, and what are you thinking? How is this user, depending on how, uh, what age and what demography that, that particular user comes from, how is that user going to use it, whether it's a grocery app being used by women or men, and what days they're going to be used more? What, what is the ex experience you want to give to the user? At least we can design around it. After that, you have to come to the user testing. So when we are actually, and, and user testing is normally done in three ways. You start with the experts review. If you're developing a retail product, you could go to subject matter experts 
and do some online assessments. You could throw your storyboards to them and see uh, how, how, what kind of response you get from those experts of uh, that particular industry. Another way to do that is user interview. So once you've developed your minimum viable product, you could keep it in front of uh, your user. You could share it with them, let them use it, and you could actually record the way the user is actually and the end user is actually using your product and see how where they drop off, where they're finding it confusing, where they find it difficult to understand which is the next step, and that would give you a lot of details. You could also do surveys and interviews with them. Then test as users. You yourself or your testers could actually um, try to act as that particular user, which is indeed very difficult. For example, you had to test uh, uh, nursery rhyme uh, app, an, uh, 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 an app for a kindergarten student who is looking for nursery rhymes there. It could be a little difficult for a 30-year-old or 40-year-old to suddenly think like that of a 3-year-old or a 5-year-old, but you need to try your best to do it. And you could do it probably for, for some other apps which are to be used by adults, it would be easier. The idea is to ask the right questions and capturing the right format. What this means is when you're interviewing your users or when you are asking questions to the subject matter experts or when you are using it as the users, your focus should be on exploring the app and asking the right questions and making sure that you capture it in the right format. And I'll come to the format part of it, what I mean by capturing it in the right format. Uh, but the right questions mean that they have to be the right questions targeted towards making uh, an optimum user experience that, that we could with the current app. When, we, when I said that testing is something that we will have to do throughout, that was because a product is typically, uh, when it's going through different phases of product development, we could test it. We, our goals to test it would be different. Our approaches could be different. And our methods could be different, but we have but we have all the chances to start that testing from the start. For example, when we are strategizing the product, when we have not even created it, we could use uh, certain methods like surveys and studies that we talked about the subject matter experts also, and besides that, some more data mining on Gartner uh, assessments or some other uh, analysis, and we could come out with. Uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, thoughts on what should be our approach because our goal is to find out what should be our direction, what is the opportunity in that particular market. So we are identifying those when the product is in, uh, it's in uh, strategizing phase. When we start to develop it, our methods of testing that particular phase change. It becomes more qualitative because we want to understand in detail the kind of risks risks it is carrying. We don't want to see uh, just numbers. So we want to make, make it more descriptive. We want to make sure that we're talking about uh, the features and its impacts and its, its risks and its uses in details. So we use more qualitative approach like uh, participatory design, prototyping, uh, studies, usability studies, lab tests, stuff like that. And when we are actually, the product has been developed and you want to now test it like proper testing in terms of um, actual end uh, level, that's where you need to, uh, when, when you're trying to measure that particular product to its competition or to its earlier version, then you need to have some, a little more uh, benchmarking abilities and assessments and surveys and or A-B testing as you call it, more quantitative and something that could actually give you some uh, factual conclusions to be able to improve. So we use those methods. Uh, A-B testing is split testing where you have different uh, approaches towards different uh, activity, towards the uh, same application, but uh, the landing pages could be different. Okay. And these are some user research methods which I think we are running short on time, so I'll not go into the details of this, but this is what we were talking about when we mentioned that there should be some qualitative tests and some quantitative tests. So depending upon which uh, context of product used during the data collection, so if we are strategizing, if we are uh, 
actually developing the product or if it's already developed, we could go for different kinds of testing. And if uh, the one thing that I want you to notice here is like eye tracking on top and uh, ethnographic field studies on left and um, click stream analysis to your right, top right. So there are different kind of tests that are happening, but can you imagine how, how uh, somebody would be doing eye tracking? They would have devices actually uh, connected to the users and tracking where the user is actually, where is the user's attention maximum being held. So that's, and that's what brings me to the test plan here, which this is not the most ideal test plan. You don't have to use this. This is a sample one. But when I mentioned ask the right questions and capture it in the right format, this is what I meant. If you look at this, you have specific time mentioned bot at the bottom. What are your time limits for doing each activity? And you map them to what activities you have to do, who are the participants for that kind of survey or test or uh, and collection of data, whatever you're doing. What is the equipment you're using? Are you going to have a laptop with eye tracking software? Are you going to do it an online Skype call with the user? Are you going to ask him to uh, put a software that records his activities? And then you can actually take the recording later on. Depending upon what you're doing, you have to mention it here, what kind of equipment you have. And when you are actually going to execute that plan, you need to be sure who's going to be on your technical help desk if, if something goes wrong, who's going to support the user, who's going to support the interviewer, who's going to support the tester. So an exact business case that we are developing here, that, that's being tested here. So that's why it's important to have a good format where you capture all this. Nothing that we're capturing is very different from other testing, but a, a good format like this would help you know what is your next step in that one hour that you have planned with the user. When you, when you are going through with the user, what would you do first? What would you do next? What are conclusions you will derive at the end? All those uh, points have to be captured in this plan. And just to um, mention here at this point, we, we could talk more about exploratory testing and stuff like that right now, but I would really like you to understand that when you are actually testing your product, which could be besides doing interviews, you're, you're actually being a user, try to do it more exploratory way. Try to explore the product instead of going by the requirements. And, and this is not the session to explain about the exploratory testing, but I would really like for you to understand how we could actually implement. Uh, if you could Google it out or maybe write it to me, I could help you understand how we could actually do this kind of testing in an agile way, which kind of fastens up your process of testing. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we come to our last screen of the presentation, which is elements of user experience. So we've talked about all the various aspects of user experience and we've talked about uh, what, what uh, is uh, user experience and how we can narrow our target users, how we can define our products and targeted users, how we could build our app and then collect in, uh, analytics to be sure how the user is actually using the app and to come back and improve it, and then testing. So our major in, um, our key point here was that while you are doing this, you need to understand that the UI, the user interface, is on top. On this figure, if you look at visual design, that's our <coughs> excuse me, that's our top layer which you are able to see in the app. However, when you are looking at uh, the user experience, it constitutes of all the sub layer that you see here you need to start with the business goals or the user needs, where we define what is the user need, what are our business goals to meet those user needs, how are we going to solve that problem. And from the technical side, when you're looking at uh, as the software interface, you may want to see what is uh, the kind of functional specifications, but when you're going towards uh, more content or hypertext system, you may want to see what are the content requirements, what are uh, the elements required in this site to be able to meet our user needs. 
So we develop one, and, and then the interactional aspect, we develop uh, how these different user tasks are going to flow across the application. How is this user going to interact with the site's complete functionality? How is that, uh, structure, how is that design going to be structured? That comes on the interaction design. And then finally on the interface, we have uh, uh, how, how does this particular design interact with each other and interface with the visual uh, part of it. Uh, and the visual is the actual graphic site that you see, the graphic interface or the look and feel as you call it, or the navigational components where we put in those uh, buttons and radio buttons and checkboxes to be able to uh, take the user through the application. So when we are talking about, when you are trying to look at your application to improve your user experience, do not focus merely on visual design, which is the user interface level of it. Go deep into the app, get into the different aspects of the, how, how the information is flowing, how is the user interacting with the application, and get into, and how is the user able to make the best use of all the functionalities of the site, and then work towards it. Thank you so much for your time, and if you have any questions, I can wait here for your queries on the question tab, question pane. Thank you, Smita, for that great session and guiding us on how to build an amazing user experience. So uh, I'm sure most of our listeners would have a few questions. So uh, I would request them to type in their questions in the chat box, and we will take them up one by one. Uh, so uh, while our listeners are typing in their questions, uh, Smita, uh, all right, so we would like to take our first question, uh, which is what are some of the common UX mistakes that you have seen and that one should avoid when designing the UX? Common mistakes, okay. I don't, I, okay, I do not really want to generalize it, but as I told you that, um, we, we just discussed that we try to put in more focus towards the visual side of it and we want to match the color schemes. We want to make sure that uh, the app is uh, looking great, but we don't really focus enough on optimizing the user experience per se. How to minimize the number of clicks, how to make sure that the user is able to see all that the site can do for the user right on the face of it. How should we make sure that the user knows that this is all? Uh, these are all the great features of this app, and they can use it to make sure that a user enjoys using that app, and that app is really, um, I mean, uh, useful to the user. A lot of times, uh, and I don't want to take all the time here to explain this, but I will quickly say that um, how easy is it? A lot of times, the app gets so complicated. Uh, that when the user comes back after some time, it, all the app changes so frequently that the user, when, he, when she comes back after some time, they're unable to figure out how to use this app anymore. So that's, that's under user experience challenge that we've seen, changing the app very frequently, uh, even at later stages. Initially, it's expected, and, uh, but I would still say change it feature by feature instead of a complete whole UI change, which could be a little detrimental to the app. Thank you, Smita, for uh, answering that. Uh, and we seem to have overshot our webinar time already. And uh, we haven't received any questions as of now. So uh, if our listeners have any more questions, I would request them to please mail them to us on webinars at the rates region dot in. Uh, so uh, now I would like to thank our speaker again for leading such an engaging session. We are sure everyone found your presentation very insightful and now have a lot of ideas to improve the UX on their websites. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us today. You all have been a great audience. I would now like to announce that our next webinar is on finding success with a distributed workforce. It would be hosted on the 18th of November and would be led by Harrison Dam, product engineer at Pantheon. For registrations and more details, you'd be getting a mail from our side. So stay tuned and thank you again for joining us today. On behalf of Srijan Technologies, we wish our participants a happy Halloween and a happy Diwali.